it is my pleasure to introduce the best advocate that public health can have, that any community can have, and any resident of our Commonwealth can have. Under his leadership, the State Department of Public Health is delivering on his vision and has developed new and innovative programs to promote wellness, including the Mass in Motion campaign, to combat chronic disease, to address racial and ethnic disparities, and to support the successful implementation of the state's health care reform initiative. He is here today because he understands and he appreciates sessions like this, an opportunity to network and to learn. Please join me in a warm welcome for the Commissioner of the Department of Public Health and a good friend to all of us, John Auerbach. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, and, and I am really happy to be here. Um, emergency preparedness is part of core public health. And so we in public health think that it's critically important that we collaborate, work with, support the efforts that are occurring today and occur throughout the year by all the different partners that are represented in the room. And, and I think that uh, the strength of our efforts is really illustrated by the diversity of the partners that are here. So in addition to obviously folks from state public health and local public health, we have law enforcement, uh, fire hazards and hazmat, we've got emergency management, we've got emergency medical services, and very importantly, we've got hospital uh, clinicians, hospital leadership, uh, representatives of all different segments in the hospitals, and, uh, and that all of that is necessary in order for us to mount a response uh, effectively to emergencies. Um, and, you know, and, and I thought, you know, I thought more about uh, the kind of emergencies that we face, that we've collectively faced over the last 18 months, and I think they really illustrate very clearly the importance of doing all hazards preparation and thinking outside of the box, being prepared for anything. You know, we've had within the last 15 months uh, tornadoes that have ripped down the main streets in communities in Western Mass. And they've been uh, tornadoes in communities that hadn't seen tornadoes like that. Had, did, weren't, they weren't expecting them. It wasn't part of something that was uh, anticipated in emergency preparedness. You know, we've seen uh, hurricanes, uh, significant hurricanes, and I think those are part of what we'd anticipate, but there was some unpredictability in terms of those, obviously. Um, you know, within the last 18 months, we've seen the impact of a, a radiation cloud um, that uh, came from uh, the uh, results of the tsunami in Japan, uh, which uh, made uncertain whether or not uh, the water supply or the food supply was going to be contaminated. And so having the mechanisms in place to uh, measure that and be aware of it were critically important. And as, you know, one of those unanticipated something we didn't think we would be dealing with, but we needed to be ready for anything. Um, and, and we have the small, um, not reported in the newspaper, uh, investigations of bioterrorist activities, frankly, all through the year as our uh, Hinton State Laboratory uh, gets uh, materials that are uh, sent sometimes with threatening letters to uh, a variety of different folks, and we have to test to make sure that those aren't, in fact, um, uh, bioterrorist organisms. And, and I think, you know, more recently we, we saw that um, with the Boston Marathon, that when we faced record heat, that we were looking at a different kind of an emergency where we actually could see the potential for scores or even more deaths, a lot of serious injuries, and the emergency preparedness people were called in to say, should, should we cancel the Boston Marathon? Does it rise to that level of an emergency, and, and should we anticipate it or um, uh, call it off? Or if not, how can we mobilize to reduce the uh, potential deaths and injuries? And, and frankly, it was only the, as a result of the collective expertise around emergency preparedness, very much with hospitals uh, in a central role, that uh, a mobilization was put in place to deal with the marathon that uh, meant that no one died. 
and that in fact the number of serious injuries was, uh, was significantly reduced. That, was, that wasn't a result of just good luck, that was a result of emergency <coughs> preparedness, mobilization, preparedness, um, uh, expertise, uh, and collaboration across many lines, hospitals, uh, law enforcement, 911, EMTs, paramedics, et cetera. Um, and, and I think that we've also learned that the emergencies that we have to deal with are not just the emergencies that happen within our state. We also have to deal with consequences of emergencies that can happen anywhere in the world. And we saw that, as I mentioned earlier, with Japan, where there was a potential um, for a significant impact here, even though Japan's on the other side of the world. And a few years ago, we saw it with regard to Haiti when the earthquake in Haiti had impact on uh, many uh, tens of thousands of residents uh, in Massachusetts who had family or contacts with Haiti. And also we were part of the mobilization. Many hospitals, I think, including some represented here, were part of the mobilization to determine how to offer services. So it's complicated. And we need to make sure that we've got all the right resources. I remember uh, coming to uh, this building in, um, I think it was just last year's conference, where there were excellent presentations about the Rhode Island fires and uh, um, the response that, was, uh, that occurred uh, in Rhode Island, which uh, uh, reduced the number of fatalities and provided uh, really heroic care. And, and I learned from that presentation and thought that was, was um, helpful in terms of our thinking through how we would respond similarly. And, and now that, uh, and today we'll be hearing about Joplin and uh, Tuscaloosa, and I think learning from the experience in those um, you know, horrific events and how um, the emergency uh, uh, preparedness, um, diverse uh, communities were able to mobilize and again um, learn lessons from that that will be useful. Um, it would be, in addition to recognizing all of the different uh, segments that are here. I, I want to uh, take a minute just to uh, uh, thank the, my colleagues at the Department of Public Health uh, at uh, DPH. I'm very proud to work with an incredible team of people in the um, Emergency Preparedness Bureau, uh, headed up by uh, Mary Clark, who's just done an outstanding job of building that uh, bureau uh, from, um, from its uh, infancy into a, a very strong organizational unit. Uh, and we're represented here by, uh, by uh, Judy Bernice, as well as by Ed Hennigan and, and many other folks from the Bureau. So thank you all for your work and your dedication throughout the year. Um, I, I'd, maybe I would just close by saying, you know, I'm, I'm talking a lot about how important emergency preparedness is. And I think um, I, I can often just take for granted now that the, the public is aware of that and that policymakers are aware of that because there have been so many examples, you know, including the ones that I've uh, mentioned, where it's been very clear how important it is to have well-trained, well-prepared folks. But the, the truth is um, we've, we've got some challenges on our hands in terms of being sure that we continue to have the resources that we need in order to um, to uh, continue the emergency preparedness work. And, and in particular, you know, there, I have concerns about uh, the federal funding. And uh, just in the last uh, year, we've seen um, uh, reductions to uh, the funding uh, for hospitals, uh, emergency preparedness work at the federal level. Uh, and that's particularly concerning. And uh, I spent uh, uh, some time in um, visiting members of Congress where I would uh, go around as part of a team, local and state officials, just talking about how important the funding was. And actually, I heard you know, from a disturbing number of um, congressmen um, that there was at least some perception within Congress that emergency preparedness has been funded enough, and, and it's bought everything it needs, and so now money isn't needed to support this work. And, and that the, the thought was, as I talked to them, that, that emergency preparedness was really about buying things. And that the first few years, uh, a lot of money was spent into sort of buying trucks and, and uh, equipment. And that now that those things have been purchased, uh, emergency preparedness could be defunded at the federal level or significantly cut back and it wouldn't matter. And what I and, and you know, many other people have said is it, it's really not about things. There are times we actually do need 
you know, trucks, equipment, medication, stockpiles, all of that. But what we really buy when we buy emergency preparedness through the funding is we buy the expertise and the people. We buy the training, we buy the systems that are set up and maintained in hospitals and local communities and fire departments and police departments, and we can't afford to lose that because if we don't have the continued funding to ensure that people are uh, dedicated in terms of their services, updating their protocols and plans as new lessons are learned, and, and doing things like you're doing today, uh, training, uh, and making sure that we've got uh, case studies and real examples. We're, we're just not going to have the level of preparedness that we've come to take for granted. So I guess I would just encourage everyone to make sure that we're s sending those messages, not taking for granted that people understand the important work that's done. So sometimes below the radar screen, sometimes it's a small emergency that may not make the headlines of a newspaper, but I think part of our work um, over the coming year is going to make be, be making sure that uh, officials at the state level, at the local level, and certainly at the federal level know just how important this work is and how the work that you're doing uh, throughout the year is uh, reducing injuries and saving lives. So again, thank you for your dedication and, and thank you for the activities that are going to, going to be going on today. Um, I think uh, 4A and B and five regions have just been uh, outstanding, strong regions in terms of the emergency preparedness work, and we at the Department of Public Health are really pleased to be able to work with you. Thanks. All right, now it's time for our first uh, presentation of the day. Dr. Ed Thornton has a rich and deep background of 30 years. Do I have that right, Ed? 30 years 30 in years emergency and 14 medicine? 14 days. There we go. Who's counting, though? And serves today as an emergency medical physician. He is the chief medical officer of Texas DMAT-4 and is the current chair for the American Board of Disaster Medicine. Ed is, a board, is board certified as an emergency physician, family physician, and disaster medical physician. I want you at my next barbecue. <laughs> he has been actively deployed for many disaster missions, including one of his most recent in Haiti, of course, we all know that country's devastating earthquake. Ed, welcome. Thank you. Well, greetings from the Lone Star State and from the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, neighborhood. Uh, they send their warm uh, regards. And I, I feel compelled as a Texan uh, to say that uh, we we kind of think that uh, we do things bigger in Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas, and I, and I want to meet that expectation that you have that I'm going to speak about that. So, uh, just to get that out of the way real quickly, we have uh, this year we offered up a uh, a politician, uh, Rick Perry, and uh, Rick Perry, uh, you all know that he had some huge lapses in his memory. Uh, couldn't remember his name. Couldn't remember. Uh, what country he was from, I think, and uh, couldn't remember branches of government. So uh, that's a really big thing, and we threw him up there uh, against a guy who's kind of from this uh, neighborhood, and you guys can figure out the bigness there. So now that that's out of the way, I'm going to go, uh, in talking of, of disasters, what I'd like to do is just uh, <laughs> jump right into my presentation. And it's entitled uh, The Six Degrees of Separation. You know, there's the six degrees of separation for a lot of things, but it really applies in, uh, in disasters as well. And, um, and those six degrees of, uh, of disaster or six degrees of separation can determine for, uh, whether or not uh, your community is a third world community or a first world community in, in being able to respond to disasters. Could be my ER at two o'clock, it's not. Uh, a lot of y'all have probably seen this, it's Joplin, Missouri. I don't wanna steal the Joplin uh, folks thunder. See if we can get that to boot up. I'd love to think that you know all my patients were trained not to come in after midnight, but uh, that that's actually a, a, an F5 uh, that just made direct contact with an emergency department, and you can see uh, what that does. And that's an example of good planning. Uh, if you if you notice uh, the the room is empty, and uh, and it was was empty by design. But everybody was taken to the interior very quickly, and so the response from those uh, and uh, from the planning that was made there, um, paid big dividends and lives saved just in one emergency department. And I hope that uh, if my emergency department ever has an F5, that we can, uh, we can function equally 
as well as uh, as the folks there in, in Joplin. And uh, this slide really is a question. Um, hospital with a great disaster plan, yes or no? And th that's a, a Chinook that's uh, parked on the top of uh, their hospital. And that's the administrator and the doctor. And it could be you. <laughs> you, you hope that it never becomes you. Um, this picture was taken in the New Orleans International Airport and I met these two gentlemen there uh, after Katrina and they thought that they were coming into a safe environment. They didn't know they were walking in a, uh, out of their disaster and into a bacterial frappe and uh, uh, mass chaos. Um, but these guys are really heroes and actually uh, when you look at those uh, in this picture, uh, y you would get the feeling that maybe their disaster planning wasn't very good. But what was good about their disaster planning is that no one died. They emptied their hospital out. They, you know, they literally uh, looked at, at, at all their patients and said, we're, we're going to move people out who are safe to move. And the people that remained behind um, had 19 uh, people that assisted a doctor and an administrator. I didn't see another doctor or uh, another administrator when I was uh, in uh, New Orleans for 14 days. I know there must have been others who did stay. But those guys are really heroes, and uh, their, their primary plan uh, actually failed when, uh, when the floodwaters began to rise. Their secondary plan was to uh, move people upstairs, but without energy, they had a hard time using elevators, so they literally carried people uh, on their contingency plan. They literally carried people up on gurneys. And these are you know, obviously people that, are, that if they can't travel, obviously they can't really help themselves. So, um, and doing that by flashlight in the dark is really difficult. So, uh, really kind of an amazing story. And you hear a lot of stories about, uh, about how Katrina was mismanaged, but this uh, small hospital in the uh, Lower Ninth Ward was actually uh, very well prepared, and they carried out their, their they executed their, their, their plan to perfection. Um, they ended up on the roof, and, uh, and, and I think it's interesting uh, that, <clears throat> I don't know if my ER, uh, will hold the Chinook on the, on the top of my emergency department. But uh, if, if you have really good pilots, they can test it a little bit and see <laughs> what happens. But, so where do people go when, uh, sorry, where, where do people go when, uh, when there's a disaster? They, they don't go to the nearest clinic. They go to the emergency department. So those of you who work in, in, uh, and manage hospitals, they're going to show up at your place. Just think uh, Tokyo Sarin Gas. A few years ago, uh, there were a handful of people who were affected, but there were literally over a thousand, uh, close to two thousand, uh, walking concerned, and they weren't even really walking wounded. So the first question is, do, can you manage that? Uh, can you figure out who's who's really there for a reason and a purpose, and who's and who's there just because they're concerned? And you have to have a plan for that. Mass casualty drills are, uh, and, and practicing mass ca casualty is. Uh, it's effective really any place in the world. This slide I took, uh, or somebody took this slide, uh, I was in uh, Tanzania two years ago and this bus rolled over in front of, of us. Uh, there were about 110 people. Nobody wears seat belts in Tanzania. And so um, there's no infrastructure. You can look and see that there's no, uh, there's no ambulance, there's no seat collars, backboards, the things that you know, we kind of take for granted. And um, in fact, we didn't even have uh, Jaws of Life. There were 21 people who were, uh, there were seven dead on the scene and then 21 people who were trapped. And so what we did is we, we got creative and we created some infrastructure. And, and really that's the, the whole conversation that you're, you're all having is creating infrastructure. We took uh, some hand saws and we cut down two trees and we, pried the, we sawed and pried the top off of this uh, bus. And then we actually pulled out the 21 people who were trapped. One died. Uh, the others, uh, in it, when you're an ER doc, everywhere you go, you have 18 gauge needles in your back pocket. <laughs> I just feel more secure than and I, I had a priest who had a tension pneumothorax, and so I, I just uh, needled him uh, in, the, in the back of a, a Toyota Land Runner, and we went 60 kilometers to the nearest medical facility. And it was uh, when I got there, I realized that uh, they, there were no doctors there, and they didn't really understand the principles of disaster management or emergency man uh, medicine, for that matter. So. We just kind of took the place over and uh, tried to stabilize as many of those people as we could. But it's it, this is a it's a first step in managing almost any uh, almost any disaster. You, the truth is that you know we've learned from Joplin, we've learned from uh, especially Hurricane Katrina, and then 
uh, long before we had great technology, we learned, we've learned that uh, all of us could be one step away from third world medicine. I, I happen to enjoy being in Africa, but I want to do it by choice. I really don't want to have a, a disaster turn my neighborhood into a, th a, a third world uh, neighborhood where people look to us uh, for direction and, they, and they, they look to us to be uh, the people that have a plan, that can execute a plan, and that can save lives and, and maximize the number of people uh, who, whose lives are, are spared. And um, you could go from what you are now to this. This was uh, New Orleans International Airport. Um, and you can see that there's no infrastructure really for patient care there, but you just have to improvise. We, we actually were fortunate that we had a few cots uh, uh, that we took with us, and uh, we, we ran out of cots. We, we really went prepared to take care of about two or 3,000 people over three days, and uh, we uh, ended up in the, in, the, in the wee hours of the morning, uh, the ambulances started coming, and we could see lights coming from uh, New Orleans, and it's 19 miles. And for 19 miles, when all you see is a stream of lights headed your direction, you know something really big is going to happen. And, uh, and really big just got bigger and bigger. And, and of course, then there's, uh, there's also the possibility that um, not all people are happy when they arrive. Maybe the plan that they, that they were operating under wasn't sufficient for them. And they're hungry and they're thirsty and they thought they were going to be safe. And now they're angry because uh, they realized that, uh, that they, were, uh, they weren't safe and, and really their needs weren't met. So uh, this was uh, f uh, September the 3rd when most of the dome people started arriving. And you can see that um, uh, they don't look really like a happy group. In fact, none of these people look very happy. So uh, what are the six d uh, disasters that can separate you from your first world status? Uh, epidemiology, and we got a good uh, dose of that a couple of years ago with the uh, uh, swine flu, and, and we're all tired of swine flu and don't want to see it again. Biological events, chemicals or chemical spills, and I always think about trains when I think about chemical spills because trains are almost always involved, and, uh, and I don't know why it is that trains get involved in, in this everywhere in the world. Every place I go when there's a, it seems like when there's a chemical spill, it's, it's, a, it's a train. So there's railroad tracks everywhere. Um, I, I grew up 10 feet from a railroad track. And, and I never gave it a second thought when I put a penny on that track to smash it that, you know, maybe I was going to create a, a, a chemical spill. And, uh, and likewise, uh, radio uh, nuclear accidents don't have to be the big giant kaboom. Um, a, a dispersal device is more likely. And, and actually, there are some other issues. Um, I don't know if any of you know about the Waste I uh, Isolation Pilot uh, Project. It's called the WIP site, and it's in Carlsbad, New Mexico. I have a friend who's the the, the uh, he's he's in charge of safety there, and uh, and and actually what they do is they store low level nuclear waste or they want to store low level nuclear waste about a mile underground in these salt caverns. Sounds like a great plan. Sounds stable. You know they don't have a lot of earthquakes or uh, dis disruptive forces there. But when I found out that the primary way that they get to uh, uh, Carlsbad is right down I-35, and it's two miles from my house with low-level nuclear waste. I started thinking about uh, nuclear accidents in a, t in a completely different mindset, um, and and they also use trains, and so that makes me, it just makes me really nervous. But <laughs> and then uh, unfortunately, we, we live in a, in a really sad era uh, where uh, we we do have terrorists, and and the saddest part of it is that some of these terrorists are homegrown, as we saw in Oklahoma, and uh, and the, the uh, of course, natural disasters. Now, all those natural disasters, I just left them down there. Uh, y'all, y'all all know these um, by heart. Probably have rehearsed um, many times for uh, dealing with them. This is actually uh, just an, epi uh, an an example of an epidemic and what it can do. It's an airplane hangar. It's a famous picture. It's available on the internet. In 1918, the Spanish flu hit and it killed 30 uh, or 50 to 100 and. Uh, 30 million people. There's a lot of debate about how many people actually died because it was the second round the next year that really didn't get caught and our friends in public health actually identified that it was really the same epidemic and so the, the data is all kind of scrambled and 500 million people were affected by Spanish flu in 1918 and, and that's a, a rough estimate. When you think about 500 million people and when you think about uh, uh, surge capacity, there, there's just nothing really that is prepared for that. And so my question was, well, could that happen again today? Could, would it be possible that we'd have to use an, air, uh, an airplane hangar? And the answer is, this is Katrina. Uh, it's a natural disaster. It's not really um, a, a, a true epidemic, but uh, the same results. Uh, and you can see that there are people on every spot, and there are people 
not only on every spot in every gate, but uh, almost all the uh, breezeways were taken up uh, with people who were unable to ambulate. And so a really uh, uh, almost a very s uh, similar kind of uh, uh, way of dealing with uh, mass casualties and, and mass um, surge capacity. But, um, and then, you know, I, I would like to think that we live in a civil society, in a civil world. The truth is that um, I'm suspicious that there's probably somebody out there in the world who's uh, tinkering with uh, genetics. And they're probably tinkering with genetics because they think it will give them some kind of an advantage uh, when, the, when the great, the next uh, apocalypse, uh, apocalypse occurs. And what really bothers me is that, uh, you know, uh, biologic, uh, uh, biologic incidents could be really serious. And so, uh, you know, preparing for a bio, this is just a smallpox slide. And, and that's just normal small, smallpox. Can you imagine if it's gen uh, genetically engineered or altered what it might actually do to you? Uh, and um, this slide, I, it's actually kind of a cartoon slide. And, um, and, and the reason that I, I, I actually like this slide a lot because um, the guy who's, who's contemplating whether he wants to do a little harm or he just wants some recognition or you know, he just wants to destroy the world, um, you know, it kind of looks like a Bubba. And, uh, and being from Texas, I looked at it and I thought, that's a perfect slide. The reality is that that's not, that's not how the Unabomber looked. That's not how uh, Timothy McVeigh looked. Uh, those guys actually look real inconspicuous. They're, uh, they're very hard to spot and they're very hard to find. And they're not, uh, they're not really stupid. Uh, uh, if they can take fertilizer and a few other ingredients and blow up a building in downtown Oklahoma City, then we all have something that we have to prepare for. And uh, it's unfortunate, but it's the age we live in. Chemical spills I've mentioned several times, and this is just one. It's actually... Um, I read in an article somewhere that, uh, that, that it's, it's probably the, the least reported uh, disaster. Uh, chemical spills often start fires, and of course, uh, it seems like there's always something caustic or a cloud or something that people are concerned about. So, uh, and it happens uh, here and in, in countries all around the world. Like I said, the, the railroad uh, systems around the world are uh, constantly dealing with uh, some kind of crash. I mentioned nuclear. Uh, I just wanted to throw in something to wake you guys up uh, at this point in time. And, and the big blast, this was actually a, a famous picture taken out of uh, the window of a, a ship. And none of the uh, men who were on that ship reached their 40th birthday. They, back in the 1940s, their understanding of ionizing radiation and uh, radioactive fallout material, it wasn't really very sophisticated. They, they couldn't tell that sushi that was... Uh, 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 white, let's see, the white fin tuna, I think, actually has cesium-137 and 134 uh, in high amounts uh, from the accident in Japan. They, they weren't even capable of knowing what it was going to do to them, much less the environment. So we, we have a lot of uh, considerations uh, that, that we've made a lot of progress in, but there's a lot of things that we need to prepare for. I, I always like to think about... Uh, a, a nuclear scenario where there's a dispersal device and you know if you're not there close to it and you don't get blown up you know you've got fallout to worry about and you can deal with fallout if you know a few basic principles and one of the basic principles is that you, you've got to take cover uh, if you can get in a cardboard box there's maybe a little protection a, a wooden shelter maybe a little more protection and then if you get into a cement structure where there's not a breezeway, uh, you, you actually have a lot of protection. Uh, and after two or three days, if you're listening to your radio, your public health officials will uh, actually give you some information to tell you that it's safe now to come out. Um, but the part of it that I, that I always find a little bit uh, interesting is that the most effective thing to do is take your clothes off and, and, uh, and decontaminate. So I've always thought of this scenario where my family and I, because you know we're educated and we know what to do, we go into this big cement garage and a family comes and we're now with all of our clothes off and we're all naked sitting in the corner somewhere. And, and then there's a family that comes in on the other end and they have their clothes on. And so you know I'm running, I'm trying to find another space because I don't want to be contaminated. And those people are probably sitting there thinking, so that's what radionuclear stuff does to you. It just makes you get naked and go crazy. So, uh, you know, it, it, strange things happen. Uh, they really do. And you just have to kind of take everything as it comes and, and, uh, and, and use your best judgment when you don't know exactly what to do. Um, explosive, this is pretty self-explanatory, but it, what, what, really, what really is uh, uh, terrifying about, uh, about explosions and incendiary devices is that secondary uh, incendiary devices have made it very difficult for our partners in EMS 
uh, and our firefighters and, and, and rescue workers. Uh, it's intended to strike fear and it slows down operations, but you know, it's something that you need to be prepared for. And since we're collaborative here in this room, and, I, and I'm really impressed with the, the wide variety of individuals who are here, uh, and that's really the key to having good preparedness. Um, you know, we need to protect uh, and develop plans that include our partners uh, who are the firefighters and EMS uh, personnel. Natural disasters, uh, we've already heard Fukushima, Katrina, uh, Rita Ike, uh, Katrina, uh, so uh, you all know what those are. And, and uh, here's a, a slide that really is a kind of a revealing slide. Back in 9-11, 99% of all the hospitals in the United States had disaster plans. Um, interesting, in 2008, those, those same hospitals, less than 50% of those hospitals actually had disaster plans that would cover all six of these uh, all-hazard approach scenarios. And that's kind of scary. The 2010 data is, is out, and the 2010 data looks a little better. Where, uh, some, some of the data says 67%, 65%. But what's really concerning to me is that whenever I look at the people who actually have these plans, do they actually have the resources to carry out those plans? And the answer is even less. So we really have a, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and we have a lot of resources that we need to find. So what do you do whenever, uh, whenever you're, you're faced with these different kinds of things and you have limited resources? Well, the first thing that I would suggest, and, um, and probably most other people would too, is identify the things that, uh, oh, I'm so proud that my electric, my electric sound went off, but identify the causes of disaster that are most likely to happen where you live and where you work and where you're doing your planning. And you can allocate your dollars better if you do that. It's real, just a common sense principle. If you see this in Florida, it's a dead guy on a golf course. And so it's not really a big disaster. But if you see that out in uh, some of the western states, we found out, uh, this is a, a picture that uh, uh, my nephew took. He's a firefighter. And uh, we found out about uh, uh, wildfires and how awful these things are and how they really uh, they displace people just like uh, a war would or just like Katrina did, uh, mass movement of individuals, livestock, uh, pets. And then uh, the disasters don't have any rules. You, you just need to remember that. They, don't really, they really don't have any rules. I was in uh, two weeks after Hurricane Katrina, I decided I, I needed some R&R, &R, so I went on a medical trip down to Guatemala. And um, while I was there about day four, it started raining and Hurricane Stan parked right on top of our, mount, uh, our mountaintop where we were, uh, we, we were just handing out Tylenol and ranitidine, you know, just trying to be uh, helpful and, and, and treat people with their reflux. And we found ourselves in this situation. The next morning, uh, the ground started shaking at about 10, 10.30, and I thought, uh-oh, dirt started falling everywhere, and that's part of my team. And the dirt fell actually right as they passed there. And I thought, I don't, I don't think that the rest of my team really gets it, that we just had a... Uh, we had a hurricane that parked on the mountain, and, and then a 5.1, I uh, found out later it was a 5.1 on the Richter scale, and, and 1,600 people died there, just like, just like Katrina, but here in the United States, most people never heard about it. Uh, there were a lot of lessons that I learned from being there and working in a third world country, and one of the lessons is, uh, and, I, and I heard uh, your public health director talk about people, and uh, Peter mentioned people, and uh, they're your greatest a uh, asset. The next, uh, the next day, uh, two of the volcanoes that were in the area started smoking, and, and this one actually put on a fireworks dis display. It's called El Fuego, and they're supposed to be dormant. And I thought, you know, uh, well, if you think disasters are following you around, you probably need to go get some counseling. So, you know, it was, a, it was just a 2005. It was just a bad year. But, and here's a, the Pan American Highway. It was uh, washed out. The, the, the planning that they had there was not, uh, was not very sophisticated, but it was quite effective. They actually strung a rope across, and then people who uh, had uh, critical bits of information or for whatever reason, if they wanted to cross from one side of the, this, uh, this new river uh, to another, they, they just roped across, and it was very simple but very effective. And so once again, it's about using you know, what you have up here. And then last but not least, um, you know, the question is, is it safe? This is the Lone Star State where I'm from. Uh, and the red lines are uh, that run north and south, starting down around San Antonio and, and moving up uh, to, to all the way really to Oklahoma City. There's a, a, a beautiful escarpment. It's called the Balcones Escarpment. And actually, um, we, we, we had a wake-up call a, a few months ago. We had a 4.1 earthquake that, uh, on the Richter scale that moved my mom's door back and forth, and I thought, I've never seen that happen before. And I know there's, and I don't really believe too much in ghosts and spirits and stuff, so I, I thought something happened. 
And uh, the seismologist and uh, geoseismologists have told us that, this, that, that underneath the escarpment is the Val Balcones fault line. And it's, this, it's, it's got the same expectations as any fault line in, uh, in San Francisco. Now, the scary thing about that is that uh, that means that you know, we're due for a 9.0. They told us that we're due for a 9.0. But the buildings in, uh, in San Antonio and Waco and Dallas and Oklahoma City, they're not, they're not built to the same specification as, the, as, the, as the, the, the buildings in, say, San Francisco. So, you know, I, I hope I'm on vacations in San Francisco when the big one hits my state. Um, and even though we know it, uh, because we perceive that the likelihood is so low, a lot of disaster plans uh, in hospitals and communities don't even talk about earthquakes in uh, in, in the context that, uh, th that they could cause more damage than almost any of the other disasters that we've talked about. So the things that you don't know uh, sometimes uh, will, will cause you to lose your life. I took this picture in Haiti. It's a, a triangular and oval structure, and during some types of earthquakes, those are uh, often safe spaces, and, and a lot of your survivals uh, will be found in those spaces. And so we actually look in those spaces that, that, uh, that are easy to see. You see a little triangle somewhere, and you go look and see if there's uh, someone, someone in there. And the people that were in this church actually did what they were taught to do, and, they are, and what they were told to do, they ran outside, uh, 75 or 80 uh, members, and, and the, the ceiling, the overhang, actually fell in and tombed to these individuals, and they were still there when I took this picture. But the point is that the things that we don't know about uh, it often will cost us our lives or someone else their lives. And so it's a quest and it's a journey to learn and it's a quest and a journey to always um, you know, look at the scientific data that's, uh, that's out there, look at everything that happens, Joplin, the uh, enormous amount of things that we learned in Joplin. So once you've defined what kind of things that you, that you have, you have to identify your critical infrastructure and we said people uh, and, and I've, I've changed a lot over the years. I used to think it was about getting stuff because where I come from in Denton County, we have an, uh, we have an overabundance of disaster preparedness goods. We have a public health director who is, uh, is very, very capable at grant writing, and so we have all kinds of stuff. But really, the people are the ones who are going to take the chainsaws. And in and, and the first hour, they're the, your neighbor is going to be the one that's digging your leg out of a you know, a, a bad situation. Uh, and it's statistically, we know in the first hour that it's, it's pretty much people around you that are going to respond, even in uh, earthquakes and, and the other things. So uh, people need education. And uh, we all need to be, um, all of us in here need to be, our second specialty should be disaster medicine. Every person in here, every person in the hospital, if you can convince them to do that, so it's a really big thing. Um, and then, of course, the other things that you need um, and you, you will have to replace in your community, you need potable water, about four and a half liters per person a day. If you don't have that, people will become dehydrated. And, you know, it's interesting because food's on the list, and, uh, and it's kind of starting to look like the Maslow thing here. Um, but, you know, a lot of people who were in Katrina sat on a rooftop for three days, and they came in, and they were hungry. But, but try uh, uh, having somebody with an ax who's trying to, to create an opening in an, in an attic not eat uh, for 24 hours. And, and it's just a different situation. So uh, resourcing or allocating your resourcing, it just, it, 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 there are a lot of factors that will uh, tell you who actually needs the food and how you dis uh, distribute that food. Um, and actually, uh, we weren't too good at that in Katrina. Um, um, but it was a lesson learned, and so uh, MREs, you know, maybe the people with the axis get them first, so you just hope that they're good people. And uh, once again, shelter, we're talking about all this is Maslow stuff, security, uh, medical supplies and caregivers, you know, at some point in time, uh, that's obviously going to be a focus, and, and I'm including all of you in this room. It's a collaborative effort. It's not just doctors and nurses, it's EMS, firefighters, uh, a lot of different partners. And I want to bring up behavioral health because behavioral health is, uh, it's taking on a new role. And it's really important uh, that we start thinking about uh, behavioral health. Our, uh, our military has discovered that there's no such thing as, as post-traumatic stress disorder when an event just happened uh, or you're in the middle of a disaster. It's actually acute traumatic stress. And people who are trained in behavioral health and they know what to do to help people uh, learn to respond to an abnormal event and understand that they're responding in a normal way to an abnormal event it's a, it's a it's a critical new way of thinking, and uh, and, the, and the soldiers that are getting that in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan and different places around the world, and coming home, they're actually uh, they're faring much better than 
the, the people who went first, and, uh, and then we had to deal with post-traumatic stress once they got home. It's just, you, you just need to address it early on. Um, and you'll hear me mention it several times. Um, energy, at some point in time, you've got to have a chainsaw or something, and so you need uh, some form of energy. Um, infrastructure can be a hidden jewel. Uh, this, there were about a thousand of these on the parking lot uh, in uh, uh, Baton Rouge. And uh, this is Dr. Hemet Bankawala, a good friend of mine. And we were laughing because we were saying, you know, what, a, port, a thousand porta potties and, you know, and the hurricane, just, there's water everywhere. I guarantee you, 20, less than 24 hours later, we were, we were thinking about those when we were using five gallon buckets. It's just uh, because nothing worked. Uh, that when you, uh, so infrastructure can be, you know, it can be really a tricky thing and we really would like to have had one of those. So you've identified uh, the things that are in your area and you've decided that uh, there are some important, uh, there are some important aspects of critical infrastructure. So the question becomes, uh, who are your partners? How do you do cooperative planning? And if you're not doing cooperative planning, then you're leaving out really big, you, you, you will have big gaps in your disaster uh, management when one happens. And I'm gonna scroll through these. Behavioral health you'll see in there, and I, I put it up on the list a little bit higher. And I wanna say a word about other hospitals, but I'll say it later. Law enforcement, security, and of course, hazmat teams. Um, and uh, I stole this off the internet. You know, I hope I don't offend anybody by using your logo or somebody else's logo. But um, public health, uh, you just got through hearing a, a great uh, uh, discussion about the importance of public health. And, and I, I really uh, didn't learn to appreciate public health until I was in Katrina. And about every other patient who came in had some kind of a, a rash and cellulitis on their legs. And we found out uh, within about 36 hours because of our public health officials who were working with us from CDC and other places, very qualified people, that uh, it was a rare form of clostridium. And I had chosen, uh, since it really wasn't a choice, we had lots and lots of Cipro, and so I said, just give them all Cipro. Um, because we have lots of it, and uh, it turned out that that was the drug that was recommended. So sometimes uh, you do get lucky, but it's better if you're prepared. And if you listen to uh, public health officials, they will not only help you to modify the plans that you're that you're uh, engaged in, but they can help you save lives. Uh, and and I and I realized it whenever I found out what it was that I was treating, and it also caused a cascade of uh, of immunizations all over the country. Everybody got tetanus shots. My wife gave 400 in one day with the Medical Reserve Corps in Denton, and, the, and it was some kind of a new syndrome, I think, with the, her thumb. She couldn't move it for like a week or something. It was just unbelievable. Um, you, you have to partner with your, with your local elected officials because uh, uh, hopefully the people will trust them. And this is the Denton County Courthouse back in 1974. And uh, back in 1974, my office was underneath the cupola to the far left on the third floor. I was 18 years old, and uh, so I learned at a very young age that you got to partner with uh, with your with your, with authorities. Uh, you have to know who they are. You have to be able to access them. And, and um, you might be asking the question, well, "Why did I have an office there when I was 18?" Um, the second best job I ever had is actually uh, emergency and disaster medicine. The first best job that I ever had was being a, a, a registered sanitarian in Denton County. Now, you have to realize that Denton actually has two universities. There are 40,000 students. Half of them are female. And my job as a registered sanitar uh, sanitarian in the summertime was to inspect swimming pools. That's, if you're 18 and half of those, half of those 40,000 students are women, it's a great job. And I still look back sometimes and think, you know, that was a simpler, better lifestyle and, and much more enjoyable. But. So and I want to speak about behavioral health again. A lot of people think that, uh, you know, in disasters, that it's the touchy-feely kind of stuff and, and the, somebody's sitting around waiting for some mes message, uh, some astral signal from Sigmund Freud, and, and, and that's not really what happens. There are uh, actually some new training programs out there. Some of you may have had uh, advanced psychological life support. Seems like there's an advanced one for everything now. But uh, I love this slide just simply because the, the term ass and Sigmund Freud are in the same kind of sentence, and there's something Freudian about that, I guess, just all by itself. But uh, uh, behavioral health is really important, and if you don't know about behavioral health resources, this is a really good place to start. Just go to this website, look at the links, and there's some um, excellent planning ideas and some uh, good information. EMS service, <clears throat> this is also in New Orleans. The, the first morning, and you could walk around the corner and look out, and just as far as you 
could see nothing but ambulances. And it's really scary because you know that uh, you're going to alter the way you practice. Uh, you're going to have to. Um, and it, it didn't change at night. Uh, for the first three days, this is pretty much what we had. So we, we had to alter what we, what we did. And we, we learned that you don't have to have red and green and yellow and black and, you know, maybe some other colors. Uh, we, we just said it's, you're red or dead or you move down the line until somebody can actually take care of what you have. And, and later on, we realized that the most important thing that we could do was get these people the hell out of that airport. It was hot. And it was not air conditioned. Um, we didn't have food or water for the first three days for most of these folks, and, uh, and they were very disappointed in our response. So what I learned from that is that when you have disappointed people, they shoot at you, and they do some things that you, that you don't expect. And some of these people came in with, uh, with guns. Uh, I remember one guy uh, that had a shotgun that still had the Walmart tag on it. And, uh, so, you know, you, you just have to kind of go with the flow. I want to just uh, say one word uh, or two about firefighters and EMS personnel. You guys are unbelievable. Uh, doctors and nurses will not show up for 30 to 40 percent, maybe up to 90 percent in uh, some catastrophic or disaster events. They just won't show up. Um, they take care of their, their personal needs and their family, and, and there's no blame in that. Um, uh, it's, just, it's just a fact. But EMS guys, um, um, these guys, these guys are phenomenal. Uh, I worked with uh, two people from the, the International Airport Fire Rescue Unit who lost family members in the, in the hurricane, and they stayed on their jobs and, did, uh, and, and they did their duty. So, you know, it's just like the doctor and, and the uh, hospital administrator, uh, you know, stay and do your duty. It's risky, but if you're in disaster planning, there's a certain amount of risk involved, in, uh, and you need to learn to expect it. Um, I love this slide because um, if, you're, if your hospital is to the left or to the right, and you have a disaster that blows away the bridge, you're going to see a lot of those helicopters. They're, they're going to get to you somehow because that's where people go when there's a disaster. They go, you go to the emergency department, and, and so you know something happens to the bridge, you're going to see. But helicopters have their weaknesses too. If it's hailing or if there's a lot of rain, they're going to be grounded, so uh, maybe people rope across to your hospital. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing your planning, don't let somebody else determine for you how people come and how they go. If you can actually start uh, in your, in your pre-staging, in your, in your pre-planning, and work with your EMS and fire departments, uh, they can help you. Just look around your facility and see what, what, uh, you know, what obstacles there are for people being able to get to you. And some people kind of like the idea of a lot of obstacles, so they, you know, maybe they don't get as involved, but the truth is they're going to get there one way or the other, so plan it. First helicopter that I saw, New Orleans, they, were, they came night and day. I got to ride on that one, actually. I went to Mobile and back. And until you actually see what, uh, what uh, kind of damage can be done by a natural disaster from the air, uh, it, it really, the full impact of it, you just can't feel it by taking care of people in an airport. So on September the 9th, uh, I got to ride with this gentleman. And I want you to remember, uh, th this is kind of a military thing. Uh, and uh, the, the military, actually, they, they have a, a, a primary plan. When, when they do operational medicine, they have a primary plan. They have an alternative plan and then they have a contingency plan and last but not least they have an escape or an emergency plan and this was uh, our uh, actually it was the, the the e it was the escape or the emergency plan we didn't have an air traffic controller so uh, i actually got to play air traffic controller and we, we didn't have any radios uh, so everything was hand signals and we had two flight lines like this and there were uh, 16 to 20 helicopters on the ground at all times uh, even at night and some of them didn't have very good lights so you just had to be really on your toes. Um, we had a, a, a ranger, uh, an ex-ranger, who, uh, who gave us five safety tips, and, turn, and we were put out on the flight line with, with five safety tips. And the reason that I'm saying this is, is that um, evacuation and uh, rescue op operations, if you have some people that are interested in that, uh, you might want to take some time and, uh, and some of your resources to uh, hire these people or to train them. Because uh, C-131 uh, is it's complex, and if you don't have training and you don't understand the rules, what happens is you mess up their operations. But if, you're, if you actually have some training, they will actually collaborate with you and get those patients out to a tertiary facility or wherever they need to go. But you, it really takes a lot of training. It's, it's a very complex machine, uh, and so are the helicopters, for that matter. Other hospitals, um, you know, um, and I just got this one off the Internet, too. It's somewhere in Boston. I don't really know where it's at. But, but you know, other hospitals, what we say about them is, you know, and you all all do this. I know you do. You all say, well, I would not take my dead and dying dog 
to brand X to have the splinter removed from its hind parts. <laughs> but in a disaster, what happens is all of a sudden they're, they're, they're friendly competitors, you know, and, and you talk to, uh, to them like they're friendly competitors, especially when they have an empty uh, ambulance bay. And so my suggestion is that talk to them uh, as if they are friendly competitors. Identify your other local hospitals that are close to you because when you reach your surge capacity, you're going to have to have a, a plan for that. And these guys might actually end up, uh, you know, I, I kind of looked at that and I thought if I, if I were really overwhelmed and I saw that picture, I would think that's a beautiful red building. And look at that red, I mean, the yellow t uh, tape, it's just, they, they, it's artwork, you know. And, of course, looking at the empty ambulance bay or nearly empty, I'm thinking uh, that's it's a, a thing of beauty, really, if you're in a disaster. Can you practice out of a tent? Uh, this was a tent in, in Haiti that we used to do uh, 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 to remove limbs and to do wound debridement, and the Canadians set it up for it uh, for us. And as long as the wind didn't blow too hard, it was a, it was an okay place to be. This is our tent uh, in uh, in Hurricane Katrina, and if you notice, the top is off. You, you got to always think about things. Uh, we went in, and the first thing that happened was my commanding officer sent out a strike team to figure out where we we're going to set up three of these tents, the classic Western shelters, and. I sat down in a, in a chair, and I was just sitting there, and I looked up, and I could see stars in the moonlight, because we got there at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I realized, hey, you know what, there's glass, and there's no water down here, and during the daytime, we'll have natural light, and we can actually uh, save a precious resource called fuel, and we can maybe move our generators and, and stuff to other places, so we left the tops off of our tents, and uh, to this day, I still have... When people see these pictures, they say, well, how come you guys don't put the top on your tent? And I tell them, we were indoors and we needed the light. So when it comes to tents, there's always good and bad things. Uh, this is an air-conditioned new kind of tent. And uh, it can be air-conditioned and it can be cool. But I tell you what, find out where the, the generators are and go to the other end because after 12 hours of hearing those generators, you won't want to ever go back in there if you can, if you can hear after 12 hours. It's uh, a military surgical uh, tent at Katrina. And... Um, it arrived on day four, and as you all know, uh, surgical patients die before that. They die in the first 24 to 72 hours, so we really didn't save any of our surgical patients. In fact, the surgical patients that we lost, we, we took them into a, uh, a refrigerator tr uh, truck uh, that we call a reefer trucks, and so that sometimes deserves an explanation as well. But and when you take people into a reefer truck, uh, the particular one that we had, um, it was, uh, it was a, a GE truck, and, and every time I took somebody in there, uh, I thought to myself, you know, there's just something really weird, and I couldn't bring myself to quite laugh, laugh at it, but GE, isn't their logo, we bring good things to life, and here we are, we're carting in people who are dead. So, um, you know, it's about timing. Uh, if you're going to do this, just make sure that you know what the time is. Mobile uh, equipment is available, MRI scans, uh, labs, surgical suites, and then, and then of course, modular, and, and some of the guys from, uh, from uh, uh, Joplin will probably tell you a lot more about this. But modular hospitals, uh, they're, they're prefabbed, and they can literally be uh, picked up and, and flown, moved, uh, put on a train and spilled. And, uh, and, of course, the most important part, if you're an administrator, is you want to know that you have the capability of billing. This was a, a, a mock-up that they used, and, and actually it looked almost like the one that was in, in Joplin. But uh, it was on a sales brochure, and I thought, you yeah, know, they've got everything here. They can, you can bill. Um, and the... And you, you can actually, uh, the, the, the military has put up so many of these that they can, they can, they can do, uh, they can do a, a hundred person hospital in eight days. And uh, as a gift from the American people, there's one in Afghanistan that's it's a modular hospital, state of the art, uh, with all functions. Uh, and it went to Afghanistan, and it's 250 beds. So uh, identifying places where you have surge capacity, knowing that you can go from a tent to mobile or both, and then from a tent to mobile. And, and maybe modular, which is, seems to be the, the new trend. And if you're totally overwhelmed, you've got to have other places identified. Uh, good communications are important. Uh, when I was in uh, Katrina, um, I, I didn't know how to text message. And my kids, uh, they, they took a lot of, of, uh, they, of uh, pictures uh, from, uh, that they saw on television, where in some of them I was in the pictures. And so they, they were telling me how proud they were of me. And so I said, well, you know, I, I really, I, I can't say that I enjoyed it, but I, I was glad that I was able to help. And I asked my daughter, I said, what, what, what really impressed you the most? And she said, you learned how to text message. She said, I can't believe your text message. And, and actually, I had the only phone in Katrina for 48 hours that would get anything out. We had a repeater that, for some reason, was able to uh, pick up my signal. And so uh, it was sent as an email to my house, and then my wife would forward it to whoever sent it. I just plugged it in and let people use it. 
Um, the, your EOCs, um, this is Denton County EOC and this is a, is a tabletop drill. And the reason I know that is because there's a computer and a donut and a cu cup of coffee at every station. And this is our mobile command center. Uh, we're lucky in Denton that we have Goliath. There's only three of these. Uh, there's a lot of things that make it special, but just to suffice it to say that uh, you all know about mobile command centers. If you have one, uh, utilize it. And then <clears throat> we, you've already heard a lot about cost and allocation of uh, resources. And you've got to be really smart about uh, how you allocate your resources. The, f the federal and state government uh, in Texas, uh, the state government has been a little bit slow about funding a lot of things, but the federal government has been really good to Denton County and it has been good to Texas and I think uh, to a lot of other people, but we're, we're living in different financial times. So, you know, make sure that you allocate your resources wisely and uh, 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 some things that are not terribly expensive, uh, CERT team, if you don't have one, start one. Um, Medical Reserve Corps, if you don't have one, start one. Um, law enforcement, sometimes we look up as cleanup, but really these guys are safety guys, just like this, uh, this was a, a UN, uh, uh, protection force, and in it, there's a difference between force protection, safety, and uh, security, and if you don't know the, uh, the difference in those, you need to uh, just go on the internet and look up force protection, because actually, that's the force that's, that's the, the rescue force, and you have to have a plan that, that protects you from disease and all kinds of other conditions, so force protection is a real important concept, and security, safety guy's the guy that tells you, hey, that puddle of water over there has got a live wire in it and it's gonna electrocute you. So, but a lot of people think that security and safety are the same thing and they're, and they're really not. So you need to make a clear distinction about who is uh, the safety officer and uh, make sure that they're not really a security officer in disguise and vice versa. Um, that's security, that's ultimate security. And hazmat teams, like, you know, really hazmat teams are pretty sophisticated, but if you want to be a hazmat guy, you can buy one of these on eBay. I, I see them uh, about once a month or so, I'll, I'll be just trickling around and, and they sell sometimes for as little as $25. You might be the first person that picks up uh, a, a radionuclear event uh, in, that's a dis, dis, dispersal device if you have one of these and it happens to be the right kind of materials. <laughs> And just a couple of words about special situations. The very old and the very young are at risk. The poor and the mentally ill. And uh, I can't really stress how much preparation it takes for these individuals. Um, the guy that's on the left who was poor, he walked, uh, he, he didn't have any money and he was uh, a proud man. He didn't want to hitchhike. So he walked from New Orleans all the way to the airport. Uh, he arrived in his hat and his pair of pants and um, we gave him a shirt and we didn't give him any shoes or anything because he didn't have any skin on his feet uh, or his legs. Uh, he'd been in water that long. And look at the smile on his face. And so I asked him, I said, can I take a picture of your better half? And he was like, yeah. And, uh, but the point is that you know, people sometimes find reasons to be happy even in the middle of horrible things. Special word about pets. Um, it's a well-known fact that uh, most people, 30, well, 30 or 40 percent of people will die with their pets, they'll stay with their pets, or they'll go back in. And this isn't just our culture. In, uh, in Japan, around the, the, uh, uh, the nuclear disaster site, uh, 30 or 40 percent of the people who had pets went back in even after uh, they were instructed not to go in uh, those disaster zones. So you need to be aware of that and have a plan. I'm subject to it. We dug this dog out uh, in Haiti, and his, we named him Denali. You need to know if you're dealing with uh, pets about fractious animals. Uh, the fractious one is the one on, uh, t uh, to your right with the yellow gloves. And if, you know, it looks like an innocent little kitty, but that little kitty tore this guy to pieces. That was a cat from hell. And there were about 100, there were about 100 people that wanted to pet that cat. And when, when they approached the cat, and it climbed all over this guy and, and bit him and scratched him. And you know, he finally got control of it, and he was kind of laughing about it. All hundred of those people were standing about 30 or 40 feet further back. It was like <laughs> destroy the operations uh, almost immediately. Even our service people love animals. And uh, resource list, you can get this later uh, for how to deal with animals. And you need to know about these, your local laws, and which ones you can break. Emacs, state agreements that you have. Uh, memorandum of uh, understanding, and you got to do all of this has an order that has to go uh, that it, that has to be done correctly. And then your state resource contacts, and every state is different. So here are three websites that you can go to, and you just click on your state, and, you, and it tells you how to access. Uh, and, they, and they're usually either up to date, or if they're updating, they'll just give you a blank. And then ultimately, the national framework came about uh, after 9-11 and, and was enhanced, and it's a, a group of rules uh, and regulations called emergency support functions. 
And if you look, uh, we're, all of us, we're, we're pretty much ESF8 guys. So if you want to do some bathroom reading and spend about you know, 40, 50 hours, uh, just read a summary and kind of find out who all is there. Um, the, the National Forestry Service actually can come in and cook steak dinners. We found that out. Uh, when ESF-8 uh, is in, uh, when it's operational. And they also brought in showers that were capable of, uh, of, of giving 10,000 people a day a hot shower. That's nothing short of amazing. And so, as summarize, uh, you got to drill, 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 and define your potential disasters, all six degrees. Uh, take those canned plans and turn them into something real. And, and Make disaster medicine every person's second specialty. Uh, find your enthusiastic people and let them carry the load for you. And then identify all of your collaborative partners and do it before the disaster hits. Make sure that you understand your critical infrastructure needs. Uh, I didn't list all of them, uh, and it, every situation is different. So but make, just make sure that you know what yours are and that they're identified beforehand. Practice, 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 not to be uh, perfect. Actually, practice to fail so that you can find out where you're weak and so that you can implement improvement plans. And uh, remember, confusion always happens. So you got to regroup. And relief can look odd. This was a, an 18-wheeler full of uh, Krispy Kreme donuts. I don't own any stock Krispy Kreme, but they showed up on day two at Katrina, and I thought, how did they get through all of the security? It took me five years to figure out. Everybody at security is, uh, you know, they're all police officers and security. They just throw a box out and just keep on going. <laughs> and, I, and I apologize. I went just a bit over. Uh, uh, but if anybody has any questions, I'd, I'd love the opportunity to answer or field some questions. Thank you very much for inviting me.